we can always stop. Okay. And then what brought you out to Colorado? Well, the question is what brought my grandparents out here? My grandfather had hay fever, so he and my grandmother and my father, who was eight at the time, oh. sought relief from hay fever. I always think, thank God they had hay yeah. fever. I've my father and that. my grandfather, before there were shots. So the, the way one dealt with it was to try to go to a place that didn't have plants that produced mm -hmm. hay fever. And of course the mountains, oh. a dry climate, was that kind of place. Mm -hmm. They first went to Colorado Springs, mm -hmm. stayed at a hotel in Manitou Springs that had bed bugs. Oh. So <laughs> they tried then this place they'd heard of at Estes Park uh, in 1910, which is five years before it became a national park. So this is actually yeah. the year in which I can say they first came here a hundred years ago. Uh, they, they were from St. Louis, and if you've ever been to St. Louis in the summer, you would know why they would want to come out here if it, hay fever or not. So that became the routine. Uh, my father met my mother, who was also from St. Louis, staying at the Craggs Hotel in Estes. She was a horse rider, poor lady, because she married into a family that <laughs> hiked and mountain climbed, and she didn't, after she married, she didn't do much horse riding. But they did meet out here and decided they didn't want a formal St. Louis wedding, which is what it would have been. So they were married at the Community Church of the Rockies in Estes Park. Oh. And they had their wedding reception uh, provided by Mrs. Joe Mills. Now, Joe Mills was the brother of Enos, and they, they did not get along. Uh, uh, Joe and his wife, Ethel, ran the Craig's Hotel, and they spent their wedding night at the Stanley Hotel. So uh, my roots, and they still had hay fever, and then there was another factor if you had a kid, uh, which was polio. The polio vaccine didn't come into being really until the 50s. Yeah. And so from the age of two on, I spent my whole summer out here. Hmm. And this continued. And it was a pattern for a number of families who lived in hot climates oh. like Nebraska, Kansas, Missouri, Texas. They would, the, the mothers would stay with the kids up in the mountains, and we stayed various places, finally settling on Meeker Park, which was pretty primitive. Wood stove, kerosene lamps, because the electricity hadn't come that far and, uh, when World War II started. Uh, modest, and, and there were families who would come summer after summer. So it was, it was like two different lives. My formal life in St. Louis, the city life in the winter months, and then this extraordinary freedom and because parents weren't wor worried about the things I think that parents are so worried about now. And, and, that, and so I had a, remarkably, uh, a remarkable freedom for, for a young woman, as did my friends. I interrupt just one moment because of the Carnegie, what the information they gave me was that um, you're supposed to give the date and announce that you're the, your name, Somewhere. you're the interviewer, <laughs> and, and then Some introduce places. Janet, uh -huh. and um, I guess say it's, you're uh, interviewing Janet for the Carnegie. Somebody did tell me that somewhere too. So I should give the date right. and her name. My name? Your name. name. Because they, well, they need to record who, oh, who okay. the okay. interviewer was. All right. Um, this is Janet Robertson. We're in Boulder, Colorado. The date is March the 4th of 2003. 10. <laughs> 2010. <laughs> okay. Do you want me to start over again? No. That's, okay. that's fine. Um, and what I'll do is... It's supposed to be at the front, so I will edit this so that this appears at the front. The wonders then, of editing. Gosh. Okay. So I'm sorry to disturb, but I, I know they wanted that, that yeah, information. I, I, I do remember somebody saying that, but I had forgotten about it. Okay. <laughs> All right. We're ready. So she.
you to just go ahead? You should just, yeah, she can go ahead or she... I, I can't quite remember. But I, I was just saying that uh, that polio was a real factor, and so there's, there was, I grew up with this extraordinary community of, of friends. We would even visit the families in the winter occasionally, um, and it, it was a whole special world. Of course, I took it for granted, but as an adult, I realized how special it was. We would hike together, and yes, we would rent horses occasionally, 250 an hour. I was shocked when my, our granddaughter, uh, when I found out that uh, it's more like, what, 35 an hour, 25, 35, even 40, 50. 50. My grandson is taking. I, I, I was shocked, but uh, of course, the dollar went farther, too. Anyway, it was, it was just an, a wonderful kind of way to, to grow up. It's pre-television. So we made our own entertainment. One could square dance at a different lodge every night of the week, and we did often. There were steak fries. Uh, people would come to lecture at the various lodges. Meager Park Lodge was the one closest to us. And the families would hike together. And my grandfather and father had, had started hiking long before we came to Meeker Park. Mm -hmm. So hiking was just part of what we did. It was assumed. There was no question that we would hike. And so that's... We'll get lost. <laughs> it, um, can I ask you a question about this William Allen White cottage in mm -hmm. Rocky Mountain National Park? I thought that was interesting. William Allen White was a journalist from Emporia, Kansas, who won two Pulitzer Prizes, actually. Mm -hmm. And as a child, I remember reading, what I remember reading was his obituary when his young college-age daughter died, and I think it was in a horse riding accident. Mm -hmm. uh, so I knew who he was. I had and. As a kid, when we would drive up to Bear Lake, which is a starting point for hikes, the road went a different place from where it does now, and we would pass right by that cottage, and it was and it had uh, when I was growing up. He he no longer owned it; it was owned by the park, Rocky Mountain National Park. There was a sign that said William Allen White. So I, I was aware that he had this summer place, but it wasn't until much later when I stayed there and read his biography that I found out he hobnobbed with the prominent political figures of his day. He had come out here as a boy, and if you look at pictures of him, he was a rather plump man, but he'd actually managed to struggle up Long's Peak. So when the Rocky Mountain National Park started its artist in residence program, and it was one of the early national parks to do so, I was delighted to, to participate and be one of those artists in residence the first summer they had it, which I believe was 1984. Certainly it was approximately that. Um, I got, I had written for High Country News, which is a newspaper that comes out even now, and I, I sold photographs there. Actually, the park people had asked um, uh, Betsy Marston, who with her husband ran High Country News, if she wanted to be an artist in residence. But it wasn't convenient that first summer, so she asked me if I wanted to. Well, I, I could hardly believe my, my good fortune. At that time, one stayed for one week. I think now it's more typical to stay for two weeks. But this was the first summer. So the, that, that was a heady in one way, but it had its <laughs> disadvantages in that uh, when I would go to bed at night, I would hear critters. They'd be running on the floor, and then they were somehow running above my head in a crawl space, and then they were also <laughs> on the roof. So it was a very noisy place, but in spite of that, it was 
it was just amazing. I could hardly believe that I was staying in the cottage where William Allen White had stayed. He had a writing cottage behind the main one, but that had not been renovated as the main cottage had. And you have several published works here that I'm very impressed with. So that's kept you busy for the last 20 years, practically? Yeah, really more than 20. When my kids left, I got serious about writing, which I'd always loved to do. Mm -hmm. But raising three kids, all pretty close together, <laughs> preoccupied me. <laughs> yeah, and the one about Rocky Mountain, or not Rocky, Magnificent Mountain Women. That seemed to be, and who was this Betsy Partridge? Uh, so you were talking about two different books. Uh, mm -hmm. Magnificent Mountain Women was published actually 20 years ago by the University of Nebraska Press. Mm -hmm. I was inspired to do it because I, I had hiked and climbed a lot and rarely saw women on their own doing these activities. That's completely changed mm -hmm. now, I'm happy to say. But when I was growing up, it hadn't. In fact, I can, uh, when I climbed Long's Peak for the first time, the main woman I knew about was Agnes Vale, and that's because she had died tragically in 1925 when she and her companion attempted to climb the east face, the precipitous face, in winter for the first time. They succeeded, but on due to various factors on the descent, uh, she slipped and fell. Her companion, Walter Keener, went to get help, and by the time he returned, this is above tree line in winter, she, she was dead. So there's a memorial there, and that's what I knew. That was kind of the woman I knew about. I also met two Chile counselors on their day off once when my father and I and, and a couple of boys were, were climbing with ropes on Notch Top and Chile Camp, the famous Chile Camp near Estes Park, ha was certainly responsible, for, I now know, for producing some uh, very self-sufficient mountain women. Anyway, I was approached by Ruth Wright, a former congressman woman, uh, about doing a book to honor her mother. And I was in the beginning of doing research about women for a, a, a magazine. So I persuaded Ruth to uh, let me do a, a book about women who had a connection with the mountains initiated by themselves, but, but certainly uh, with the support of men, I hasten to add. But basically not uh, women who we thought of just because they were the wives or daughters or sisters of prominent men of the day. I was amazed at the number of women I came up with. And one of the pleasures was interviewing them all over Colorado. Most of them are dead now, so it's as if I, I caught them at the right time. They were, they were in their 80s, and they weren't necessarily the subjects, but they had known the subjects well. Because of that, I, I became quite familiar with Betsy Coles, Partridge, that was her last name, um, when she, with her second marriage, she married General Earl Partridge, who was one of the heads of NORAD. It was a Canadian head and an American. And found her an absolutely fascinating and, and virtually unknown woman. In fact, most, most of the women I wrote about in Magnificent Mountain Women were virtually unknown. So I decided Betsy, who'd left a lot of good writing about mountain climbing behind, she was dead at the time I wrote it, uh, I decided was a worthy subject by herself, so I wrote her biography. Mm -hmm. And there's, you then became interested in 
mountaineering in other places than just Colorado? Well, our kids were growing up, and so I'd met my husband. He'd been my rock climbing instructor. So that, that was one of the things that we, is one of the things that we've done together. We've skied and, and climbed and backpacked and, and still are doing that, not rock climbing, <laughs> I might add. Uh, and so with the kids gone, we then had the leisure to, to go literally all over the world. Mount Katmai? Kat, Katmai. Katmai. And that's, well, that's in America, mm -hmm. I guess. Alaska. <laughs> and, uh, and then there's some other place in Nepal, Solu Kumbu. The Solu Kumbu is the part, it, not province exactly. I, I don't think they use those terms there, but it would be comparable to a province. It's, it's an area of Nepal in which Mount Everest sits. And Betsy Coles apparently had been over there, had she? Yes, she was a member of the first party of Westerners ever to go there. Nepal was closed to Westerners mm -hmm. for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, it opened up when an Italian group climbed Annapurna. They were given permission. That was the first eight thousand meter peak to be climbed and that was just about then somehow um, Oscar Houston a, a New York lawyer got permission to lead a trip to ever to the Everest area even his son whom I interviewed Char Charles Houston a doctor who died several months ago didn't know how his father obtained this permission. It was quite extraordinary, actually, that he did. So he asked Betsy Coles um, to go, and Charlie Houston ended up going, and a very famous British mountaineer, H.W. Tillman, ended up going, and a Jesuit priest, Anderson Bakewell, who turned out to be from St. Louis, although I didn't know him then. I interviewed him since when he was in Santa Fe and retired. Uh, so it, and, and Betsy was such a good writer and she was a very good photographer. So I had great material to work with. Then in 1993, we and some friends retraced her route, which was a bit different from the way people go into the Solu Kumbu today. They fly to a town called Lukla. Well, there were there was no airport there. In fact, the airport in, in the capital city, Kathmandu, opened after their trek was over. So that's 1950 when the first commercial airport appeared. So they had to walk a lot farther. They couldn't simply uh, fly into Lukla the way tourists and climbers do today. So that it was fascinating. And you went to Africa and, and Georgia and Russia. Another, oh, Tibet, it says also. Mm -hmm. So you've been all over the world mm -hmm. where there were high, built, high mountains. <laughs> As Dave said, we seem to go to places that look like Colorado. We're not tropical people. <laughs> yeah. What was the trek, the eight day trek with the Norwegian Mountain Club? Uh, that was in the Rondonne Mountains of Norway, and it was perfectly delightful. And a lot of this has to do with Norway is a beautiful country, and Norwegians are generally lovely people. We'd, we'd been to Norway before uh, in 1970 and not been back until we went on this, this trip with our friends, Margot and Chris Browkley, with whom we've traveled many places. We climbed Kilimanjaro together in Mount Elbrus, and we've just been all over the world with Margot and Chris. And there's Torridon Mountains in northern Scotland. And we were area. again with Margot and Chris. I couldn't find them on the map, but I found <laughs> the city of Torridon. This was uh, in northern Scotland, and the, the web 
the internet has certainly enabled one to tie into trips that it used to be a lot harder to locate. This one started and ended at a, the Rue Lighthouse. So we spent the first night and, and really uh, the, the, the last night there. I've never hiked in so much rain, although when we went to Iceland, there was a lot of rain there. Uh, the, the two women who ran this B&B &B in what had been a, a lighthouse that was in use would uh, provide an itinerary and, and the instructions would be, that they started us off and, and we drove in a car, the instructions would be like, uh, go down to the beach you'll, and then you'll come to a stile and go through that and go up 300 yards and you'll find a path. So they were, <laughs> it, it was a, a wonderful, wonderful experience despite the amazing amount of rain. <laughs> I didn't want to tell them that ours were 13,000. But I have to say they're pretty darn rugged too. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. And there was another place, uh, oh Peru, there are two high mountains there that you went down to? Yeah, we didn't climb the mountains but we did a trek that got as high probably as 17 or 18,000. And, and we went to Machu Picchu. Uh, this was for our 25th wedding anniversary. Oh, so nice. And it was a wonderful trip. In contrast to, to Iceland and Scotland, we had not a drop of rain. And it was an organized mm -hmm. uh, trek. Great fun. And what about your um, work with the Colorado Mountain Club? Sounds like you've been quite active with them. Yes, I've been very active with them. My father joined and I in 1952 because in those days if you wanted to climb mountains over 14,000 feet it was really hard to find out how to do it unless you knew someone had, who had done it. The Colorado Mountain Club had a lot of people who had done 14ers. They were not nearly so accessible as they are now either. There was almost, there, there was a bit of literature about them, but it wasn't, now there are videos about how to climb the peaks and numerous guidebooks. So that was really my father's reason for joining. He decided he wanted to climb the 54 peaks that are over 14,000 and I, I loved to go hiking with him. So that's what led us to join. And that's why I feel it's, uh, it's just been part of my life and David's life. We actually met because he was a rock climbing instructor for a Colorado Mountain Club Boulder Group school. Then he worked for Alice and Roy Hayabar and they were prominent CMC members and became good friends of ours and of my parents. So the club has been so intertwined with our lives that it was a pleasure to serve on boards such as the Colorado Mountain Club Foundation. And you have climbed all of the peaks in Colorado over 14,000, mm -hmm. wow. That must have been quite a... I started when I was young and didn't have a particular desire to do it. Then I thought, and, and they're not certainly not necessarily the hardest mountains at all, but people do recognize that if you've climbed the 14ers you, you have some experience and you're fairly knowledgeable and I thought it would be an asset to uh, have that on the fly or on the cover of Magnificent Mountain Women. And it was really quite interesting. <laughs> And you've climbed Kilimanjaro mm -hmm. in Africa, so you've been all around the world. Mm -hmm. Up and around. <laughs> yes. That's amazing. 
a lot of people in Boulder have it. Uh, in fact, people who travel remark on how they'll be in some godforsaken place and they'll talk to an American next to them and it turns out the Americans from Boulder. I mean, this has happened to all of us a fair amount. People in this town are extraordinarily well-traveled. Well, I can't think. I think I've pushed everything here. What should I do now? <laughs> well, I have a... Uh, I'm going to go back to the beginning and ask, um, I think you answered this somewhat earlier, but <clears throat> one of the other things that Carnegie wants to know is your age, when you were born, if you're willing to do that. Oh, of Some course. Some people aren't. And that, that's just a fact of life. <laughs> I, I'm, I will be 75 in a month, so I was born in 1935. And are you still climbing? I think Climbing isn't quite the right word. I, we hike avidly. I've had two knee replacements. I, I love to cross-country ski. So we're very active, but active at 75 is different from active at 40, 50, even 60. And I also wanted to ask, what brought you to Boulder? I, because I had fallen in love with Colorado, I decided rather than going east to school, which is what I really was supposed to do after going to John Burroughs School in Ladue, I, I wanted to come here. It was my first chance to see what this looked like in winter. I've been wrenched away now for 18, 16 years in the fall when we had to go back to school. And this was my chance. So that's why I went here. And I, I had early on, I think, as a child, in retrospect, thought, why would anyone want to live in Missouri when they could live in paradise? Which is what I regarded and, and continue to regard this being. So it was a no-brainer. And indeed, I went to school here and, and did take up skiing, although not as avidly as later. I, I loved it. I had marvelous professors, many of them, who who were here because they loved Colorado. What was your area? Of I majored class? in English literature, took a writing class from Alex and Marie Warner, um, minored in, I think it was French and philosophy. <laughs> and can you recall some of your impressions of Boulder when you first moved here and how that might have changed over the years? Uh, 28th Street didn't exist. Uh, it was a dirt road. I think there was a Kentucky Fried Chicken out that way that we students would go to. Very few students owned cars. That's certainly a big change. And so that meant that Tulagi's, which is where you could buy 3-2 beer, was really important. It was on the hill, Tulagi's and the sink, because generally you walked everywhere. And there was a bus into Denver, but there were not local buses in Boulder. So if you had a friend who had a car, which I did, that meant you could get out of Boulder. And sometimes my, I, my friends would pile into this friend's car and drive up to our cabin at Meeker Park. After we rented for many years, my mother decided this was silly. It was, my, why didn't we build our own place, which we did uh, over right after World War II, over the winter of 45, 46. Mm -hmm. So we had a log cabin, which we still have and use a lot. And it's up there? Oops, Near Meeker Park. Yep. Meeker Park is a little community which is four miles north of Allen's Park oh. uh, on okay. Highway 7. Mm -hmm. We can't see Long's Peak from our house. That's a little bit further north. But Mount Meeker, which is 13,911, is in our backyard. And you've been 
active with the Rocky Mountain National Park Association. Mm -hmm. When I was going to have knee replacements, I got off my boards, which were the CMC Foundation, the Rocky Mountain Nature Association, which was then had split into two parts, and I was chair of the part that eventually folded back into the association and the CU Museum Advisory Board. I was active with that. And what about this committee that uh, put together a traveling photographic exhibit about Colorado women? Did you, is that? I, I was one of the committee members. That, yeah. And that was in connection with my being on the CU Museum mm -hmm. Board. <laughs> it sounds like that you are, you've been very um, active in promoting women and bringing mm -hmm. women into the 20, 21st century. Could you describe how that began and what kinds of things that you did <laughs> other than rock climbing or in addition to rock climbing? Well, rock, you know, rock climbing was, was a big one because there were not many women at all. I did... RMR started in, I think it was 46, and Roy Hayabar, our friend who had the equipment store, was one of the founders of it. I joined RMR, although I must say when I, I went out on, on some mission, as they call it, that involved a small plane wreck with two corpses in it still, I realized I was not cut out for RMR, not that part of it going on the missions. But I knew so many of the, the guys who climbed and, and climbed with them. So that was part. My, my main um, interest in women was really formed by growing up and seeing how few women went out hiking, climbing. It was all with men, except for very, very few exceptions. I saw that the Colorado Mountain Club and comparable organizations like the Sierra Club, I'm sure, and the Appalachian Mountain Club and so on, really nurtured women because these were clubs for educated people, uh, many of whom were, had leisure. And many of these women went to, had university degrees. So I feel that the clubs uh, were, were a tremendous influence on women getting out on their own, and then institutions like the Chile Camp that I mentioned certainly were. But I, I love how, how the, uh, the landscape has changed when you go hiking or climbing. They're, they're often on a weekend there'll be as many women, and, and they're in all female parties, climbing, say, Long's Peak or uh, Mount Audubon, which is much easier, but still, the, the graphics has changed so dramatically, mm -hmm. and, and I think this is just great. Through the Colorado Mountain Club, I solicited women to go out on a scheduled trip in the middle of the week, and so in 1972, um, the Wednesday ladies started which I, I felt I was largely responsible for. It was actually another Colorado Mountain Club man who suggested it when I would come into the Boulder Group CMC meetings and say I'm tired today because I've been out with some female friends who had kids and we would get out while the kids were in school. And uh, when, when this group, which is still going, although it's certainly uh, changed. Many of us are in our 70s, some are closer to 80 than to 70, and if they're in their 60s, those are the spring chickens. So that, so a lot of things have changed. We're not the homogenous, uh, relatively small group we used to be, but people are still going out. Not as high, not as far, and when we go out, we're apt to see other groups. But in those early years when we ski toured, 
we were frequently, and going way, way back, we were frequently the only group doing that. And we learned a lot of things on our own. I do feel that certainly for my generation, women learning to ski didn't want to fall and were intimidated by their husbands often or other men. And so the learning environment for skiing, for just learning about being way back in the country um, where you weren't going to see anybody and being self-sufficient, uh, that, that this was a huge benefit to, to have women doing this. And some of us had, had had experience, certainly like myself, hiking as kids and camping, and then others had not but it was a group of women who were all eager to try and it's I think in many ways a rather remarkable group. Mm -hmm. and what about this Explorers Club that you were chair of in 99? Of the the Rocky Mountain group. Mm -hmm. uh, Ken and Ruth Wright again in, invited me to join after Magnificent Mountain Women came out and it's a not a terribly active group here in the Rocky Mountains. It was started in the east, in New York City. That's where mm -hmm. their headquarters are. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until about 30 years ago they permitted women to join. <laughs> this is, was not that unusual. And we have been several times to the uh, their annual meeting, though not in recent years, which is held in the Waldorf. And I remember the first time I went, they had a Tyrolean traverse from one balcony in the third or fourth floor going across. And one of the speakers um, also, I think, rappelled down from one of the high balcony. I mean, it was, it was so different. It was tuxedos combined with this sort of zaniness <laughs> and, and very interesting speakers. to find out about uh, your house and when you moved here and what you might know about it since it is, I'm not sure if it's in the Mapleton Hill Historic District or listed individually. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I can't remember if we list, I, I, I'm not really sure. We have never initiated anything, but I think it is in the district. Uh, I, I, I did research on it once when one of our kids had a project uh, at Mapleton School. All three of our children went to Mapleton School, which alas has sat empty now for a number of years. Mm -hmm. It's on the hill. Uh, it's on, on, yeah, on Mapleton and it's, it's west of 9th Street. A wonderful, wonderful school. Um, so we, I did research, and at that time one could access the county records pretty easily. I, I think that's not the case now, but I mean, I could look at the actual deed. And the way one told, uh, could tell that a house had been erected on the lot is that the taxes went up. So based on that, which, which is sort of an indirect way, certainly, but based on that, we figured this was built in 1876, which for Boulder is quite early. It was built by a man named Squires and his father-in-law, uh, and I can't think of the name of the, what is called the oldest house in Boulder. It's on Spruce Street and, and it's named after his father-in-law. And I, I simply, the name eludes me. Anyway, so, so we have reason to believe it and, and he, uh, Mr. Squires, apparently sold lots in this general area. So it, it was really one of the early houses. Uh, the alley just to uh, the west of us was platted as 10th Street and never put through. And in fact, it abuts a, an east-west alley just uh, on, on the north side of our lot. 
which in turn is right next to the farmer's ditch. And then you have Mapleton Hill, which is a real hill. So I don't know why it was even platted as 10th Street. It's not a practical <laughs> way to have the street. We're lucky that it's remained an alley rather than a street because we, it serves as our driveway and we have a, a, a garage here uh, just adjacent to that wall. Some, a few people in the area that have a garage attached to their house in the Mapleton Hill District. And, and the, the stream that's up there, is that That's the, farmer, is the that farmer's that? ditch. Oh, the farmer's ditch. Then, yeah, farmers one, one of the, see, one of the, we now know, hundred ditches or so from that great exhibit they had at the library last summer. Is there a pathway that people can walk? Well, it's an alley. Oh, okay. You see, it, it's an alley in back of the houses where I used to walk our dog when we had one. So it's an old house. This was the garage. You see that brick wall? There was a a, a rather tacky stucco one-car garage that was attached to this house when we moved in. Oh, amazing. And then eventually it was transformed into my office and my dark room. I used to do a lot of black and white photography. So we've been working on the house sort of ever since we bought it in 1963 for an appallingly small price <laughs> because such houses were not in demand then. There were new subdivisions, a table mesa going in, and those were much more desirable then. Not the case now, but we've sure enjoyed it. So you mentioned your photography, your dark room. Could mm -hmm. you tell us uh, your um, how you learned photography and black. Yeah, I, I took an adult education class with a friend. Uh, I'd never done any black and white. I'd, I'd taken color slides ever since I was about 16, and my parents took slides. So that was very much a part of our family, is taking pictures. But I, I really had, was beginning to become very attracted to black and white photography. Um, are these your pictures mm -hmm. here? Yes, although that's my granddaughter. Those are our grandkids on the bottom one, and those are not pictures that I took. But uh, I just great. thought that f black and white rendered the mountains in a way mm -hmm. that made one look at detail somehow rather than color. I, I like color too, but I really fell in love with black and white and had, had this great adult education class in it. Wonderful. This picture with all these people in it, what was that? That was my mother's class from a woman's college in St. Charles, Missouri called Lindenwood. Um, and I, it was not framed when I, we found the photo after my mother died, but I thought, this is a great photograph. They don't do it this way anymore. Mm -hmm. no. And in fact, I, I was scrutinizing it uh, recently, and I found a, that a man in the front is holding a little dog. And I thought, this is probably the president, and maybe it's the, the mascot. I mean, I know nothing about it, but I've never seen a college picture where somebody who looks prominent is, is holding a dog. <laughs> Did you do this one with the bears in it? Yes, that's oh, in Katmai that? National. That's I think it was. Scary. I think it's now a national park. It was a national monument when I took that. I'm not clear on that, uh, but it was taken from a very safe vantage point, oh. in which which was erected when the then head of the Department of Interior not entirely a popular man among environmentalists, was going to visit. And the uh, Park Service figured that no matter what their personal feelings, and I, I gleaned this from one of the rangers we chatted with, they better make sure that no harm came to James Watt. So <laughs> they erected this, this balcony right by a river, the Brooks River, 
below falls, which was a gathering point for the Alaskan brown bears because the salmon would come up the river and then try to jump the fall. So it was just perfect. I mean, you watched bears from this platform and um, we, a, a ranger took us there to the platform mm -hmm. and we were there for several hours. It, it was just astonishing mm -hmm. to, to watch this. Th that picture is a sow chasing away a boar, a, a young male bear. And I'm sorry I didn't get her cub in the picture, but the boars <laughs> will try to kill the cubs. Oh, really? um, and, and so nice. this mother, who, who really looked like she was rather a flaky mother up to this point, mm -hmm. somehow her cub was pretty far away, and, and we had watched a much older female bear with her cubs, and she was attentive and clearly an experienced mother, and this wasn't. Yet when her young was, was uh, threatened, she suddenly, all her right instincts came in, into do. the fore, and, and, you know, I never could have gotten this photograph if I hadn't been in, in a safe place. Uh, we, two of our kids live in Alaska, and uh, we have six grandchildren who are from Alaska, although one, the, our oldest, lives in Jordan and then the other two live there, and then we have three in Anchorage. So we probably made 50 or 60 trips to Alaska altogether, uh, visiting them and just backpacking all over the state. It's a magnificent state. This um, 2004, you did the Rocky Mountain Rustic Historic Buildings mm -hmm. in the National, Rocky Mountain National Park. That must have been interesting. It was a very interesting. Mm -hmm. Sh should I get a copy to show sure. it? Maybe, oh, maybe our cabin is I've got to unhook you. Oh, 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 forgot that. <laughs> Glad you right. thought of it. If you want to get it later, I can just edit it in. Okay, why sure, do why, don't, why don't you do that? Yeah, okay. The, uh, somebody, we gave, they wanted a cup of print of our cabin, which is up in Fraser, and uh, I wonder if, well, I'll look at the book. <laughs> See, it's there. It was an old cabin up on 72, which is out of Fraser. And it was brought up, we brought it, we bought it and brought it up. Oh, really? On our uh, property. <laughs> it was an old sheep herder's cabin. Logs. Yeah, authentic, uh, an authentic log cabin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Rocky Mountain Rustic, the, the second part of that is historic buildings of the Rocky Mountain National Park area. So we confined ourselves We're to... Not in the park of itself. A few are in the park mm -hmm. uh, and many are around the park. Mm -hmm. um, that was a great project and often collaborations don't work. Uh, I've heard horror stories of, of writers having big fights uh, when they're really? collaborating. Mm -hmm. But uh, this was three writers, three people who, who wrote the book, and we got together because Kurt Buckholz, who's the executive director of the Rocky Mountain Nature Association and a historian by, uh, by his background, uh, Gave, gave first a talk in Estes Park, this is about, oh, more than 10 years ago, and then one in Grand Lake, each side of the park. Mm -hmm. And his, the, the thrust of his talk was that there are marvelous old buildings in the vicinity of Rocky Mountain National Park, and there's really very little protection. They don't have standards saying if it's 50 years or older, you can't do this or that. He had observed in his years as the executive director and living in Estes Park, that a lot of these buildings had been torn down. So his lecture at each side of the park was, what can we do to prevent this? Well, I attended the Estes Park lecture and two other people attended the Grand Lake lecture and we didn't know each other, but independently we contacted Kurt and said, 
we would like to write a book about this. <laughs> And he put us in touch with each other. So it took a long time for us, us to get to know each other. Pat Rainey lived in Grand Lake. She and her husband had moved up there a few years before this conversation took place. And that turned out to be a huge bonus because Grand Lake was had, has some wonderful, big, old log cabins built around, say, 1900 around the lake in the days when people primarily from Denver but other places as well uh, pre-air conditioning would would go up to where it was cool in the summer and and by now they were it was third generation you'd have many many people who would get a slot every summer and and so the logistics were very hard and, and Pat was invaluable and she'd also been very active with the historic society there. So it turned out that her connections to Grand Lake were, were critical to including the, the many structures there that we did. Mm -hmm. Then Jim Lindbergh was the assistant uh, to the director of the National, of the Rocky Mountain region uh, of the National uh, Trust for Historic Preservation in Denver. Mm -hmm. So Jim uh, was invaluable too. He had a larger context and it turns out that the Rocky Mountain rustic style and, and we defined that, it, the term, we didn't invent the term, but we did define it as using local materials and often in a rustic fashion. Um, and, and, and he said that in many cases um, the park promoted this and, and the little t tourist towns promoted it because people who came out from the Midwest or the East wanted to feel they were in the West. And the architecture, the rustic style architecture reinforced that feeling. So it, it was just, uh, I learned a lot. I thought I knew a lot, and I did, but it turned out there was a lot I didn't know. We had a wonderful editor, John Gunn, uh, who lives in Rollinsville and works for the, uh, the park, or Rocky Mountain Nature Association, in publishing books. And since you had three writers with three different styles, uh, it really was important to have an editor and John was such a good editor. So he melded the styles and he mm -hmm. caught our mistakes and errors. And the photographs were provided by the three authors as well as professional photographers. And then Cheryl Pennington, who's gone on to have a very good career in doing this, uh, hand colored the, the historic black and white mm -hmm. photographs. Yeah. So and we, none of us had any expectation of getting rich. We were not doing this for the money. We did actually get our expenses reimbursed, which I thought was <laughs> a pleasant surprise. I don't think we were even expecting that. But it was a very satisfying book to work on. And we just got along so well. After we got to know each other, it, it took several years just to get to know each other and to figure out how to do the book. I'd better be getting on my way or I'll be getting a ticket over there. Right. <laughs> Just have one more, one more question. And that, and that is, have that. you had an exhibit of your photography? I did have um, an exhibit at before the Boulder Public Library was renovated of my black... I, I've had two there, actually. One of Peru... Uh, of our trip there because I, I had a Hasselblad and so I, I've taken black and white and color mm -hmm. and and then another exhibit was about East Portal. East Portal is refers to the East Portal of the Moffat Tunnel mm -hmm. and uh, a favorite of ski tourers and there at the time and the reason I, I wanted to have the exhibit was uh, there were problems with people using private land and what was going to happen to it and the owner was nervous about liability with all the skiers going up there 
and uh, eventually this was resolved by a trading of, of the land. And so at one point the owner was, he didn't close it off, but he, he had it run by another outfit to collect tickets and so on. And, and it was just a big question mark. And at that time in the 70s, it was becoming ever more popular for cross-country ski tours. So that's why I had that exhibit. And uh, in fact, it was resolved and it's a very, have you ever been there? Are you a skier? Not really. um, it, it's just a very popular area. It, Where is this? Well, it's west of Rollinsville. That's too far west for me. <laughs> <laughs> As I say, it's the west side of the Moffat Tunnel and if you take the, the train through the tunnel, you end up at Winter Park. So it's just the east portal of that. We're just west of Winter Park, the town, and, and we're just east of Fraser. Uh huh. Well, it sounds like a. Do you use it, or you, your daughter? I didn't up there last year at all. The kids were up, but uh, doesn't have, we don't have any water. We do have electricity, and. Uh, it's just not the most convenient place for me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's really roughing it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It was wonderful when we were all young. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. You're wonderful too. Thank you for being here. <laughs> I've never done this before. You've been, you've done it before, haven't you? I have. Yes, so. Cover first. And then hardcover, which is the reverse of a more typical sequence. It's it's still selling. It was such fun. It Looks really like was. Cabin. Okay. Speak loud. Okay. okay. After I took the picture, and we had been escorted to the site with, on a ranger walk. Um, most of the people on the walk, in fact, everyone except David and me, went back with the ranger, but that only permitted an hour or so, and David and I were busy photographing bears the whole time, and rather incredulous at being so close to these huge animals and yet feeling so safe. So finally, and David had brought his fishing rod, although in the end we just photographed bears. That was a lot more fun than fishing. So finally, the two of us started back uh, on our own, that is without, a, there were people around, but we, we started out and there were two very tall guys who it turned out were from New York City who asked if they could go with us. They had been dropped off by a guide on the lake where we were staying and there were, there were various fishing camps all along all around Knack Knack Lake. So we said, sure. So we started out and pretty soon the tr we saw that the trail went close to one of the sows we'd been watching. Her hair was wet. I could have reached over and touched her. And we <laughs> this gave us pause. She was sleeping literally by the trail. But we went past, and I thought, oh, thank God, that I've never had an experience like that. Soon after we'd passed, David said, ah, oh, forgot my fishing rod. And I thought, this is a test of my marriage, and I'm going to flunk it. I said, David, leave the rod. No, no. And I said, I will not go back with you. <laughs> so he went back, and I thought, well, the bears are well fed with salmon, so probably it'll be okay. Well, this changed the whole dynamic because I was now with the two very tall men from New York City. I was the only one of us wearing a bear bell. Uh, usually I don't wear bear bells, but up in Alaska, I have a different feeling about bears than from what I have here. So, it turned out they expected me to go first because I was wearing the bear bell. By this time I was, we'd actually been to Katmai before this. We, we went there in uh, 19, 
63, uh, 65, our first visit to Alaska. This is about 20 years later. And we're just about running out of tape. Okay, right. so yeah, I'm have to I, would, I would stop and, or pause and they say, ring the bell, lady. And finally we encountered um, the man who had driven, who had flown the plane and left them there. And he looked up at them and he said, you're a couple of sons of bitches. So then I knew it wasn't in my imagination that I was to go first because they were scared. <laughs> That's a great story. Isn't that a wonderful story? <laughs> okay, tell me again who, uh, this is the Wednesday ladies, and I think the date is there. I don't have my glasses on. Can you read the date? I'll get them now. We're out of tape, darn. Okay.